Hello, welcome to Irish Football Fan TV. I'm delighted to be joined this morning by LOI Weekly co-host and Irish independent journalist Dan McDonald. Dan, good morning. How are you keeping? Morning, Paul. How are you? Good, good. Uh, how are you keeping throughout this uh, coronavirus? Obviously, you're keeping busy and on top of things. We have um, I've seen a piece this morning regarding Noel Quinn and people are going to be grilling him regarding the, the League of Ireland return. So what what is the story there? Obviously, you've done a piece this morning. So do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, well, I mean, as you said, like this, this has been a story that's been going on for, I mean, for, for a couple of months now. And the whole debate around the future of the league and where it stands in 2020, it's, we're no clearer to solving it. I mean, I actually had a few days off last week and thought, uh, you know, there might be a resolution and, and, and yet now we are in a situation where we're, we might know where we're going to stand until the middle of June. So what's happening this week is that um, basically players in the league, the, the, the representatives of the players at the respective, uh, you know, sort of professional, semi-professional clubs have requested a meeting with Niall Quinn just to ask what's happening, you know, um, on a number of levels. I mean, we have a situation this week where the clubs that are in Europe uh, the four clubs in Europe are back. They're starting to undergo uh, the, the COVID-19 testing with a view to playing in a European uh, preparation tournament in July. And they are still planning as though they will have European games in, in July, August, although there's a debate about what may happen with those matches or how they may play themselves out. But there's obviously people at other clubs, uh, players at other clubs who um, have been told that they won't be able to start training until June 29th, but they also know that there, there may not be a season to come back to at this stage because the clubs haven't yet agreed uh, on coming back to football. That is the in all of the clubs um, who who effectively between them, you know, need to agree that uh, they are satisfied that financially it's worth coming back for the 2020 season to play out the rest of the 2020 season. But at this stage, the FAI and Niall Quinn. Um, have yet to come up with a financial package with compensation to make up for the loss of you know fans going to games that has convinced all of the clubs um, that it's worth coming back uh, and that they wouldn't lose more money from, from coming back than they would by not playing. So um, it's something that's been playing out in the background over the last couple of months. It's it's kept people busy, I guess, but it's it's been pretty frustrating in terms of maybe the last couple of weeks. It's it's slowed up, and I think players just have a lot of questions that they want to put to Noel Quinn, uh, and probably a lot of the questions that fans and, and other people might have too. Yeah, like eighty-seven percent of I think it was the players came out. I was at a survey. I think they did, and they all want to get back playing. It must be so frustrating. I think you did a piece as well, uh, or you put out a tweet on it like that we're like the only league with no kind of plan to get back and i think even the moldovan league i think it was um had a structure in place you know to, to to get back playing and you know i don't know about you but i i wouldn't know of any moldovan actual league team like i obviously know the national team but not a, a league team whatsoever not even one team like yeah i see the problem is that and naturally, we look in Ireland. Our our culture is so heavily influenced by what's happening in English football, and we're we're listening to all the debates about, say, Project Restart and what's happening in the Premier League and the Championship, and maybe even in Scotland. But um, the point I made in the piece a couple of weeks back in in the Independent was we really should be looking at the other summer leagues in Europe because we are a summer league. You know, our our season you know, doesn't, it wasn't due to finish in June, July. And a lot of decisions that have been made, you know, in England and Scotland and other leagues around Europe that either cancelled their league, you know, abandoned it or agreed at points per game or tried to play and are back playing, as we see in some cases, you know, they reached that decision from the perspective of, well, the season's going to end in a month or two anyway. Um, so players would have received most of their contract money for the year, et cetera. Um, and really, a lot of what they're doing is with a view to trying to start next season roughly on time or there or thereabouts on time. You know, that, you know, maybe September, October, later than planned, but they can get going into next season. Whereas here, um, you know, our season is due to run up until October, November. Um, yet, of all the 12 summer leagues in Europe, we are the only one that's talking about, well, maybe we should abandon our season. Maybe we should call off our league. When the other eleven leagues who are summer leagues, they're all you know 
across June, July or already, um, they are playing. So in theory, time should be on our side here, um, big time. You know that we, yeah, we may have to push the season back, but that we, we're not under the same pressure to finish our league. Because, for example, we already know who's going to be in Europe because those places were decided last October, November. Yeah. Um, but the the reason and the very valid reason I do understand that the reason why there's a question mark over whether our league will return is that um, of those twelve leagues we have by far and statistically this has been shown through UEFA we have by far the highest reliance on spectators going to games I think 28% of income uh, for Irish clubs in total comes from fans going to matches and clubs don't know what they're going to do without um, or some clubs don't know what they're going to do without those fans coming to their game so that's why we are in the position that we're in but we are the only league in Europe with our calendar that's talking in terms of waiting till 2021 and as time goes on um, that looks I mean it's it's not really like this is all about health and this is all about you know the health crisis and of course but the reasons why football may not return in Ireland this year are less so about public health now and, and just more so about the health of clubs well, I think as well Stephen Bradley came out I think it was a piece with Paul O'Hare um, in the mirror and I think it was Paul anyway uh, but he yeah. came out and said um, you know uh, if we were to cancel this season, you know, it's at the league back 20 years and it's kind of hard to, to disagree with him in a sense, but he's trying to find the balance as well, as you mentioned, you know, with the smaller clubs and the bigger clubs, but also it comes down to, again, uh, health and safety, but you look at like so many toilets and, you know, facilities at grounds, so just like Tala's the only one that kind of springs to mind that's of, of a very high standard and then you kind of look around the rest of the league and not really so much and that would ob- obviously be a worry as well. If you were to try and get spectators back in, but obviously this virus with no vaccine kind of coming out at the minute. Yeah, no, that, that is true, and, and that's why like the plan that's you know the provisional plan. When I say plan, I mean the plan hasn't really been properly presented yet. It's been raised with clubs, but not necessarily you know put on the table and go here's the plan, here's the compensation, here's everything. But like the plan as it stands would involve only a small number of grounds being used, uh, with Talib being amongst them. Um, but selected grounds, basically neutral grounds. The plan is that actually teams, Shamrock Rovers wouldn't be able to play at Tala, say for home matches, that they would remove you know, home advantage from the equation. But that a selected number of grounds around the country from Tala to Thoman Park, you know, which isn't even, I mean, doesn't even have a League of Ireland team at the moment, to maybe Athlone from a regional perspective, uh, a Western ground, be it Sligo Galway, maybe even the Aviva as well, which I'm sure would be a buzz for players. But the logic behind it would be, you know, a small number of grounds. Um, this is without fans, um, but where where the FAI would be able to run like a, a sort of a, the health and safety operation to ensure the testing and all this. And, and rather than say 19 different clubs all trying to put their own arrangements in place, that they centralise it to the five or six. Um, now the FAI are saying they would pay for all the, 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 the cost of, I suppose, testing and, you know, which is a substantial enough cost um, but but naturally then clubs are saying well so we don't again this is the more the poorer clubs in the Premier Division the, the argument would be so now we don't not only do we not have fans coming to games but we also need to travel to play to all you know to play all of our matches and there'll be travel costs and, and other issues as well and I mean I, I mean Stephen Bradley has made his point very clear and 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 Vinnie Perth and Dawk indeed as well and you know the, the top full time professional clubs. Um, who have players that are all pretty valuable assets in their own way. I mean, they're all desperate to get back. The clubs at the other end of the division who maybe don't have as good a squad, uh, who do, you know, who whose whose commitments to players are very much tied in with their results and and and, and how things go, and, and they rely on say fundraising. They don't have European money coming in. Say they're they're the ones who are opposed to a comeback. But like the debate is coming around. I think to a discussion about, well, are we now in a situation where, say, you know, our top full-time teams were Jack Byrne, were, you know, Danny Mandrew, and and you can take your pick of all the top players, Michael Duffy in the league, where they all are unable to play for for a season and are basically, I don't know, laid off or, or sort of allowed go for free or who knows what would happen if there was no football. Um that there's a situation where they're ready to play and their clubs are ready to play and there's a health reason where they can play 
um, yet the season doesn't start because of the health of clubs at the other end of the table. And uh, that that that's an unusual discussion to have. But I mean, the, the, those clubs that are further down the table, they're only trying to protect themselves, and you know they're 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 living week to week sometimes, um, and it's a tough existence. And the broader issue is that our league is very unequal. Um, and and that's a problem if you, if people are who watch this who are maybe fans of English football or whatever that you know the you know in in England like you know you'll have the championship and championship clubs are all on a certain level and League One they're all on a certain level and League Two I know there'll be big clubs in each division like Leeds and Portsmouth and Sunderland but broadly like the the conditions for players are are roughly the same um, whereas in our league in the same league we'll have a full time club we'll have a part time club. You know, we'll have we'll have clubs with, with completely different living situations, and that's why it's very hard to to find a a, a uniform solution that suits everyone. It's because this league is just it's a bit weird in terms of its makeup, and it makes it very hard to apply a a, a one size fits all solution to things. I think that obviously comes from you know years of neglect of the league as well. But yeah. do you think? You know, you, you've had Noel Quinn on your show, LOI Weekly, and it was a really good listen. But do you find that he's he's a kind of positive change in that regard? From what I hear I and mean, kind of the, the things I've seen so far, it seems like a good move so far. Yeah, I, I think Noel Quinn probably still has work to do to, to win people over. But what I definitely would say is that um, the change we do have is that at the top of the League of Ireland, sorry, at the top of the FAI, sorry, we have people who are very focused on the League of Ireland um, and its problems. Now, it's one thing to be aware of the problems and it's another thing to actually have the solutions. But there is, I think, even people who would have been quite sceptical about maybe uh, Niall Quinn and, and, and the new era, who are, who are coming to realise that at least that they are trying and that it is something that is on the top of their agenda. And it is. I mean, I, I know from... Um, I guess my awareness of uh, you know, private discussions and what's going on, that it, it is something that they are working and trying to fix but the League of Ireland isn't an easy fix and, and as you said, it's the product of years of mistakes and neglect and there's um, you know, it's, it's like coming into a house that's trashed, you know, you can't just do it up overnight, like it takes a bit of time to, to fix some of the problems that are there and as I said, I'm not sure if they have all of the answers, I think some of the solutions that have been raised through this um you know to try and deal with this crisis possibly have been unrealistic in 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 parts but um i mean they are unlucky as well because a couple of months back it looked like irish football was i mean the fbi was in danger of basically words like liquidation and stuff were being thrown around and they they got this rescue deal with the government um you know with uefa and it looked like there was an opportunity to take a breath and, and see where we go. And then this unprecedented, unexpected crisis has come around the corner and knocked them back. And all of a sudden, like what might have been their honeymoon period, they're now under real pressure to make a decision or else it looks like they failed if football doesn't come back for the year. So as much as they might have good plans for the league and their intentions for the league are good, um, if they're not able to find a way to get football back, then all of a sudden there's going to be a lot of, um, there's probably going to be a lot of criticism going their way. Yeah, I think, it, it is, as you said, it is a little bit unlucky because it looked like Irish football, you know, the crowds were really good at the start of the season and everything yeah. was kind of on a upward trajectory. And it was just, yeah, as you said, it's, it's just really frustrating that this kind of came in at such a, a bad time. The the game between Dundalk and Shamrock Rovers was a great advert for the league, and I think people were starting to get a little bit of a buzz. But this tournament, um, how how do you see it kind of playing out? Like, I, I suppose in some ways, at least football is co- trying to come back in, in, in some part. Yeah, well, it does seem like. I mean, UEFA at the moment. Now, the, the, the key date here is probably going to be June the seventeenth, um, because UEFA's next big meeting is is June seventeenth, and. At that, they're going to make, and we might talk about the international thing in a minute, and that's it's going to come out of that as well. And um, that UEFA at this meeting really need to make some decisions about their calendar for the rest of the year, um, both club and and, and international. And um, from what I hear at this stage, certainly, you know, they are planning to have 
uh, those early stage European qualifiers for those four teams that are involved in the tournament. But we still don't know what the attitude is going to be towards air travel and, and um, you know, going from country to country uh, in late summer um, or whenever these games take place. And a lot is going to depend on really what case numbers around Europe are like over the next couple of weeks. And who knows? I mean, do we feel differently now than we did maybe two, three weeks ago? Perhaps we do because our, our numbers are, are going down. So maybe in three weeks more time, um, both here and around Europe, we'll have a better idea. So the plan is for those four teams, yeah, to play a tournament either in the Aviva or Tala. There's a sort of a mixed mixed views on where it would take place. Um, but yeah, some games, some matches. Now, by then, there is every chance that you know the Premier League will be back too. So the novelty of seeing football and TV say that with, with players that we're really familiar with, you know, it might have gone by that stage. But at the same time, for people who are very passionate about the League of Ireland for, and for people you know, who want to see team sports in Ireland, because I think this, the plan would be this, this tournament would be the first team sports event in Ireland. Um, so ahead of rugby and, and Gaelic football. And I think even those associations and players in those associations are looking very much at the FEI right now and the testing the players are undergoing at these four clubs. How are they doing it? How are they paying for it? Like I think there's going to be 12 tests before they play that, those games. But yeah, I mean, I think there will be an appetite. You mentioned that Rovers and Dock game, uh, which was, was so entertaining. And it's a chance for, you know, the best players in our country to get back out uh, on the pitch. And, and we hope that all things go well with tests between now and then. Um, but it's really, it's almost a, an attempt to try and give us all a bit of confidence that, that we can play team games, you know, we can run behind closed doors, that maybe by then we're even starting to think about August and could we let a small number of, of fans in? Although, as you said, some of our stadiums are better suited to that than others. Um, but it it's something at least for something to, you know, for players and, and managers and people to look towards. But of course, it's still a bit weird for them if they don't know for sure that the, the season itself is coming back. So like June 17th is the date because UEFA are really going to lay out their schedule for the rest of the year then. And I think the FAI and clubs will need to know, they'll need to be able to tell UEFA, well, here's what we're doing in Ireland then too. So if there's one date people want to take away from this where they might know what's going to happen, um, that would probably be the one. Yeah, we're just going to lastly on the League of Ireland, and you know, say it does come back and fans aren't allowed in. Do you think it, it would be a worthwhile thing to get like live streaming in? And I think you, you mentioned there it could be huge bragging rights for the FAI if they do, are, are, sorry, are the first kind of association back getting sport back within Ireland. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the streaming is a big debate, and it's a massive part of this. Now, one of the complications is that the FAI still have a broadcast deal with Air Sport, who I obviously. Know, do LOI Weekly with and uh, with RTE, who are entitled to show X amount of games, you know, as per their contracts. And they also have an overseas deal, but it's just for, for a betting company. But um, that limits maybe the opportunity. I mean, let's say, right, Rovers and the Dock are playing again, and the massive interest in that match um, off the back of the first one. But there's every chance that RTE and Air Sports, who have a contract, are going to pick that game and show it live. So as a result, it might be available for, for streaming and it'd be the same with Rovers Bowes and maybe uh, you know the, the, the better matches. So um, clubs remain to be convinced, I guess, that there's enough of a demand, say, and I'm just, I'm not picking on the clubs, but I mean, these are some of the clubs who are opposed to it. So I'm guessing they're not that optimistic themselves. But if you're talking about a, you know, a, a Sligo Rovers Waterford game, for example, um, may not be as, as, lucrative for a streaming audience um although ironically you know sligo and 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 for example cork who would be in the opposite i mean two of the best supporter clubs in the country really um but will the figures add up how many people will will, will pay um the fei again this is where they're maybe you know they're, they're they're leaving themselves open to questions about how realistic it is that they are talking about interest from america and streaming companies overseas but there's a debate to be had about how many people say, okay, I know there's Irish people abroad and so on, but look how many people around America uh, and, and other jurisdictions are going to be willing to pay to watch our league. You know, in a way, I could see what they would do it at the moment when there's very little football going on, but it's very possible by July, August, we could have all the leagues back. And as a result, you, you lose a bit of your exclusivity. So 
this is the, the this is the debate now i still think that we need to explore streaming seriously and it's an opportunity to tr- to try it to test the waters like who knows we, we could be wrong about this there could be more demand um you know people in sligo who who go to home games but don't go to away games might be willing to pay to watch you know away matches like in england there's this program called i follow which means you know fans of say preston or gillingham or whoever it might be that they can follow their club um and, and pay to watch their games if they don't travel now at the moment obviously we're talking about paying for home games too um which is unusual but it is worth trying but the argument that clubs say well and and, and Niall Quinn said it in our podcast that he was trying to say like that streaming money isn't going to make or break this that it would be a nice bonus if it worked yet at the moment it still seems that they are relying on some money from this and clubs are saying it's it's a gamble so um it's a I know I'm going down a bit of a rabbit hole here, but like streaming is definitely a part of it. But it is one of these things that until you go to the market with something properly, you don't know what the demand is. And it's a question of whether you're willing to take the risk or you're not. And that is actually the central debate over what happens with football here. And um, I know streaming is an essential part of it. And I guess for years we've wondered what the demand might be. Um, we may well find out this year. Well, I think I think that again goes into you know I think there's a lot of people within the league and you may you may or or, or may not agree on this, but I feel as though th- they don't like change and they don't like they like the 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 way things are the way they have everything set in stone and what not every club now but you know the majority and I feel as though when something like streaming or something is mentioned it's like oh 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 no instead of why not just try give it a go and see what happens? Now, I know you said there's TV deals and everything, and that kind of complicates things, but it could be the the ideal opportunity. And I think maybe you mentioned, obviously, other leagues could be back and stuff like that. And if we had it, could have maybe done this a couple of weeks ago, but I'm not sure what the story is with... with Health-wise, that wouldn't have been allowed, though. That's uh, the only thing. But I, I was going to say... you're saying, but it wouldn't have been allowed. Yeah, because I was going to say, look at the, the like the Bundesliga. Like, I wouldn't be a massive fan of that, but now that's on, and I, I've been watching nearly every game. But I suppose they have the kind of global uh, audience that we don't, unfortunately. Yeah, but, uh, they've, yeah, they've had a better, they've had a better crisis, I guess, as well in Germany too, which is the other thing. Yeah, we're just kind of obviously we've we've touched on the League of Ireland there, and the the key thing to take out of it is that date you mentioned, June seventeenth, and we're going to know a bit more regarding that and obviously keeping an eye on um Niall Quinn's meeting with the with the League of Ireland players and, and um squads and that. But on to the international and uh scene, are we any closer to knowing, you know, if Stephen Kenny's first game's gonna be either after or before a few Nations League games, or is that again fall into that June seventeenth car- category? It, it, it sort of does, yeah. Um like it's this has changed so many times since um since March even, you know, because we, we went through phases of okay, there's gonna be triple headers in September, October, November, to um okay, maybe it looks like there won't be games in September. There might be a, a massive long window in November, December where there'll be six to eight games. Um, you know, we we we've had all like, you know, phases of okay, playoffs will be in October, no playoffs will be in November. Uh, will it be put off till next year? Like we've had all these debates, and it's all it's all tied in with a broader sort of sum and equation. That to put it simply, <clears throat> the biggest thing for UEFA financially at the moment is to get the rest of the Champions League and the Europa League played. Uh, the, this season's Champions League and Europa League, because that's worth you know big money to them. Um, and if that money comes in and those games go ahead as planned and TV and broadcast deals aren't affected, you know, it gives them a bit of financial certainty in some areas for the rest of the year. And it's sort of the same. People keep saying, uh, and this, you'll see this in England, and, and they don't really, because they don't worry about their finances as much as, um, as we do here with our, our smaller association. People say, oh, well, the Nations League, they'll just scrap the Nations League. You know, the Nations League will probably get scrapped. When actually... The Nations League is really, really important for the finances of UEFA as well, because, um, you know, this 10 million a year deal that every association in Europe gets and the FAI, it's actually less than 10 at the moment, but it's going to climb to 10. It all comes from, 
UEFA's TV money and UEFA's TV deals. So that's why they need their big marquee games to go ahead. And they need the big nations league games involving the big nations to go ahead because that's where the money comes from to go around Europe. So it's like really important that these nations league matches go ahead. And it's probably more important that the nations league games go ahead than it is that the playoffs go ahead because the playoffs are for a tournament that doesn't happen until next June. And I mean, in the initial, in the initial 2020 plan, uh, we weren't going to find out in March whether Ireland were in the tournament that takes place in three months' time. So actually, there's no real need to know until next March uh, by that same sort of logic. So um, it's sort of been clear probably for a while that UEFA will try and do everything they possibly can to get the Nations League played. And the playoffs are probably next down the list. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, there's obviously talks and, and ways of, of trying to get both of them in because what we've seen with this big long delay is like teams have had to change managers, not just Republic of Ireland, but Michael O'Neill and, 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 and other countries as well. Denmark as well, I think. Yeah, so like, there's all, these changes have been happening. So uh, to answer your question, it sort of depends on what happens with the club schedule because UEFA were talking then at some point, and this comes from FIFA, that maybe they might need to leave September and October completely free for domestic club football. Uh, and maybe as well that if they're going to have any travel, the priority will be to try and get next season's Champions League going and get teams qualified for that and as much as possible for that because they need the money. And again, they need to get those competitions going and underway. And that international might just be pushed to the side, but that's not decided. They're looking at scenarios, but... Um, it is very possible, like hugely possible, that Ireland's next game won't be until November. Um, it's very possible that there won't be a game played in front of fans this year in terms of a, an Ireland game at the Viva. In fact, I think the FER are basically planning off that at the moment. And anything else, I think, would be a bonus. Uh, that if there are games in the Aviva Stadium this year, they'll be behind closed doors. And I think, um, I'm not sure that even if you have a restricted number of, say, fans domestically within games and you might have like Champions League and, and Europa League qualifiers taking place, I'm not sure if UEFA want to be encouraging fans, say, travelling, flying, you know, from one country to the next to watch a game. So I think for supporters, and this is obviously, you know, a, a fans, um, you know, a fans channel that you're sort of, you're running here. Um, it's not good news in the context of, chances of, of seeing Ireland games in the flesh this year. I think um, I'd love that to be wrong. I'd love if the health picture improved and, and we had the confidence to, to look at plans for later in the year. Um, but at the moment, that's going to be the way. And it's it's very likely Stephen Kenny could be waiting until November uh, to start his work. Yeah, obviously that's going to be very unfortunate if that is the case. But um, just the fact that Stephen's in there now, and, and you know Stephen, I, I think personally as well, um, very nice man. But what do you think of his appointment coming in. It was going to be a natural kind of progression anyway. There was so much confusion. I'm kind of glad it's out of the way now. But from your own perspective, um, him coming in now, he's obviously worked with a good few of the youth team now. And he looks like probably they'll probably take them in. And I think in some ways it could potentially be a blessing because they've another year now of football to get under, under their development that yeah. could po possibly bring them into, say, a playoff or a Nations League, you know? It's true, actually. Yeah, I mean, it is strange that. Um, I mean, this this thing is all bad news. But if if there's any good news, um, it's that maybe some players who wouldn't have been experienced, who have the ability, but maybe wouldn't have been considered experienced enough in March 2020, um, we might view them in different terms in November 2020 or whenever these games do actually take place. Um, or or it may well be that like one game is in a different month to the other. Um, hopefully that we, we do get through the first one. Um, but yeah, I mean, I suppose the more, the more things go on with this, the more the handover makes sense. I know there would have been some people who would have argued that, um, you know, Mick McCarthy was in, entitled to stay on. I'm sure some players might have had that thought. And my personal opinion, I wrote this at the time, that if the playoff, this was again, this is, this is a couple of months ago and we didn't really know what was, how bad things were going to get, I guess, or, or we were we were thinking, well, if the first game in September is the playoff, then it should still be Mick because Stephen Kenny won't have time with the players. He won't have 
you know, a long enough time with them. But actually, I think if we were in a situation now where um, you've, you, you might have Mick McCarthy for, for six months during this period preparing for a game, and then Ireland just say lose the match, and all of a sudden you'd be thinking, why did we waste this time to give Stephen Kenny more time to think about the job and what's coming down the tracks? And he's now having time to mentally prepare himself, to get his staff together, and probably to just, you know, to, to, to familiarize himself with what's coming down the tracks. Uh, so I think it actually makes perfect sense. Um, now, it doesn't mean Ireland are going to suddenly just get through the playoffs as a consequence. It's, it's a tough game whenever it's played, and it would be a tough game for whatever manager. And I don't think any, I don't think there should be an over the top reaction to whatever whatever the result of the playoff is going either way, because Stephen Kenny will be judged on the World Cup campaign, and, and the Euros will be a bonus. But your point is 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 right, you know, um, that maybe in six months' time, okay, we'll see what happens with club football um, and the championship and so on. But but the likes of yeah, Jason Malumbi and Jason Knight and. Troy Parrott and Aaron Connolly and, uh, you know, some have more exposure than others. Adam Ida will be, you know, that bit older um, and, and maybe maybe we'll see what happens with England with the five substitutions and the fixture schedule and um, will clubs be less likely to, to, to spend big money in, in this transfer window if there's a small turnaround between the seasons and, and as a result, will young players be given more of an opportunity it's very possible that would be the case. Like I've always said, I, I don't think um, Stephen Kenny is going to like come in and rip up the squad that's there. I've never agreed with that point of view. Um, I think he's he'll be he would be more pragmatic than that, and he's not just going to promote young players for the sake of it. I think he will promote young players if he thinks that they're ready. And I think it just so happens that there are some young players coming through with attributes that he will really like. But I think it's wrong to suggest that he's suddenly just going to rip everything up. I think he'll be excited to get the chance to work with some very good players that were there who he might feel, um, you know, there's more in them. And, um, and that's why people talk about, um, naturally talk about Stephen Kenny and talk about, well, what's this mean for all those young players I've mentioned, but it, it might also mean something for Robbie Brady too, or, or, um, you know, bigger role for Matt Doherty and 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 maybe other players that are there. So um and with between himself and Keith Andrews and Damian Duff, they now have a good long run at it um to see where they're going. So hopefully that leads to better things. I, I think you're right in that sense in what you said there as well about, you know, people like Adam Oida, he may even benefit if if Norwich get relegated, he may benefit yeah. of uh, playing in the championship next season. Do you know what I mean? So there is as much as probably he doesn't want to see Norwich go down, there is benefits to that as well. But Dan, uh, I've catch it over a half an hour. Uh, I said I'd keep you for half an hour. So listen, yeah. Um, yeah. I really appreciate your time and a uh, huge fan of your work. So it's been a pleasure having you on the channel and uh, hopefully we'll speak to you soon. And um, for anyone who's watching, make sure to check out uh, Dan's on Twitter at Dan McDonald 82 is that right? Uh, it's, I think that's the Instagram. It's McDonaldDan82. But uh, hey, on Twitter, that's where I do most of my work stuff. So. Okay, and then uh, obviously don't forget to follow LOI Weekly on both Twitter and Instagram as well. Dan, thanks very much for your time and uh, have a great day. I'll speak to you soon, okay? Thanks, Paul. Look after yourself.